Amen. Amen. We'll invite you to stand as we sing together our theme song, To God Be the Glory. be seated. Good evening. It is my privilege this evening to call for the offering, and that offering is for evangelism, and I am told that every offering taken here will be for conference evangelism. Amen. I am old enough that several significant milestones have arrived for me. I was raised in the Catholic Church and never read nor touched a Bible until I was 20 years old. I had begun dating the niece of Seventh-day Adventists who lived across the street from my home, my parents' home. And on our first date, I asked her if I could go to church with her sometime. I will admit I was more interested in her than I was in the church, but I was interested in the church. I was very disillusioned with the Catholic Church, and so the first time I went to church, I met her there, and I sat down beside her, and she said, did you not bring your Bible? And I said, I don't have a Bible. Why do I need a Bible? And so I looked on with her, and we went home to her family for dinner, and she gave me the first Bible I ever had. 
I started reading Genesis, and that was pretty interesting, and I got to Exodus 20 and went, whoa, look at this. A couple of months later, Elder L.E. Tucker from the Quiet Hour came to the Tampa First Church for a series of evangelistic meetings, and Becky and I attended most of them, not all of them, and on the final Sabbath morning, I responded to an altar call Amen, to accept Jesus. I stood up and that, that aisle of the church was a mile long, man. A month later, after studying with the pastor, I was baptized and about six weeks after that, Becky and I were married. And this Sabbath, June 4, marks 50 years. Wow. <clears throat> the girl deserves a medal of some kind. Two years later, I enrolled in what was then known as Southern Missionary College and graduated two years later. And for the past 46 years, I have served and had the privilege to work in pastoral evangelism, 34 of those years right here in Georgia Cumberland. Fast forward to one year ago, my pastor, you didn't know pastors had pastors, right? But we do. Rick Grieve is the uh, Northern Region Ministerial Director for our conference, and he called me and asked if my North River Church would be willing to host an evangelistic series for a just-graduated student from Southern. COVID had messed up his plans for meetings the previous year, and in order to fulfill his graduation requirements, he had to do a meeting. And I thought, well, Rick, we're not, we're not ready. We haven't done any of the pre-meeting stuff that we normally would do, and, and I just don't know. And as I was making those excuses, the Holy Spirit said to me, what makes you think you know when you're ready? I told Rick that and said that we would discuss it as a church board. And some of my board members said the very same thing. Well, we're not ready. We haven't planted any seed. How can we expect a harvest? And I told them what the Holy Spirit had said to me, and we discussed it, and they voted to do it. A couple of days later, I met Pastor Drew Weaver, who is now the associate pastor at Chattanooga First Church. Plans were made, brochures were mailed, and a young lady and her husband, who lived not very far from the church, received that brochure in the mail, and they were amazed. She was amazed. She had been raised in the Adventist church and had drifted away a bit. She's here tonight, by the way. Amen. And she and her husband came to Drew's meetings. Amen. As they listened, Valerie was drawn more and more to Jesus and made a decision to come back to the church of her childhood. She was baptized in August of last year, and her husband is nearly finished with his series of Bible studies. Amen. And he will be baptized soon, I'm very confident. And by the way, if Victor's around, my North River congregation is very eager for Pastor Drew to take my place when I retire <laughs> at North River. Some of them want me to retire now. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, I'm here tonight to tell you that evangelism works. Amen. It worked 50 years ago for me. Somebody long ago had given offerings so that there could be an evangelistic meeting in Tampa, Florida. And evangelism works today. And I urge you to give extravagantly tonight so people from Bristol, Tennessee, and Kingsland, Georgia, and Thomasville, Georgia, to Cookville, Tennessee, and everywhere in between, that thousands might hear the good news about Jesus' unfailing love for the lost and about his soon return. Amen. Let us pray, let our ushers stand, please. Father in heaven, gracious Father, please bless the funds given tonight to the end that thousands may hear the good news of a love that loved enough to die and of the very, very soon coming of Jesus our Savior. In his name we pray, amen.
Isn't that beautiful? I was blessed to have them at my church there in Calhoun when I pastored down there and got to hear that quite often. Thank you all. Our speaker tonight is the Director of Church Growth and Revitalization for the Southern Union. But that didn't really say a whole lot about who Richie Halverson is. Richie Halverson has been married to his wife, Brittany, for 24 years. They have four kids. Richie is a PK, pastor's kid, an evangelist kid. And there's something that I used to hear quite often when I would go to Richie's church. You see, before Richie went to the union, or should I say before the union stole Richie, I hear the Bowman Hills member saying that's right. He served right here in Georgia Cumberland Conference at the Bowman Hills Seventh-day Adventist Church. And multiple times when I would visit there, I was, well, probably the best term is threatened (laughs) to never let Richie leave or move him somewhere else. We tried all we could to keep him here in Georgia Cumberland, but the Lord had bigger plans for him as he witnesses and leads across the Southern Union. We are very excited that he still calls Georgia Cumberland Conference home. And I know that tonight we are going to be blessed by the message that he has to bring to us. He's going to be with us all week long. I know you are going to be blessed. And he asked me as we were sitting back here, how long do I have? I said, You have at least an hour, but your Bowman Hills fan club wouldn't mind if you went two or three. So he has liberty tonight, and Richie, we are so glad to have you here for camp meeting 2022. And before Richie speaks, we have another special music. Good evening. We are a full-time music ministry based out of South Carolina, and we are so grateful, and we want to echo the sentiments that it's so blessing. We're so blessed to be back at a live camp meeting. Amen? And I just want to encourage you, if you've been inspired by the music, especially from us tonight, to come and visit us down at the ABC and maybe pick up a CD and visit with us. Thank you guys so much. We're so grateful to be here. Sometimes the rain pours, sometimes 
I can grow and adjust. I can't see you right now, but I can feel you somehow. May the storm make it known you are still on the throne. Yes, you are still on your throne. Good evening, church. Thank you, Elder Rusted and Georgia Cumberland Conference, the best conference in the Southern Union. Now, I said that to Kentucky, Tennessee last night, too. Uh, but no, this is where I call home, and it's just a blessing to be able to be able to be here and worship with you and to be here in person. Amen. There is something powerful and unmatchable about us getting together, uh, assembling together, and worshiping and praising God's holy name. And I tell you, it's just a blessing to be here at Southern. I've got a daughter that goes here, a son that went here. I went here. It was kind of interesting as I was driving back here. I was kind of cool. As a speaker, they gave me this parking permit where I can park anywhere in campus that I'd like to park. And I have to admit that as I pulled up and I saw all the campus security, I started getting a little nervous. Because the last time I saw all those campus security when I went to school here, they were escorting me off campus. And so I picked up my, my I was just showing it, my, like a badge. I'm safe, don't tackle me. Uh, no, it is a blessing to be here. God has been so good to me, and I know God has been good to you, and I praise the Lord for each and every one of you. I am going to be sharing my, my testimony tomorrow night, uh, so I'd love for you to definitely make plans to be here then and the rest of the week, because I know God has a miracle in store, amen? Amen. I, be I believe that God is going to do something amazing. What about you? Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory. Great things he has done. This has been a tough past few years, amen? Some of the toughest years I've ever been through. And as a pastor, there's some of the toughest years. I love all, man, I want to give a shout out to all my Bowman Hills church members. And I can call them my members because they still don't yet have a pastor. So uh, I still claim them. And, and, and praise the Lord, what a, what a beautiful church it was. But the past few years has been rough for all of us. It's been a tough past few years. And so if we're here tonight, we've got a lot to be grateful for. Amen? Amen. The enemy keeps on attacking, but hallelujah, Jesus keeps on saving. And so tonight's message is entitled, When the Storm Keeps Raging. Let's pray. Most gracious God, we want to thank you and praise you for the awesome God that you are. I pray that I would be hidden behind your cross, that you might be glorified, magnified, uplifted, that your word would be lifted up and that it will not return void. I thank you and I praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. In Acts, the 27th chapter, verse 20, it says that when neither the sun nor stars appeared for many days and the storm continued raging, we finally gave up all hope of being saved. Man, if I had to pick just one verse that really just sums up the past few years, it's this verse. A pandemic Poor economy, inflation is rising, greatest job loss since the depression, suicide is up, depression is up, drug overdoses are up, domestic abuse is up, divorce is up. We see shooting after shooting, storm after storm. In fact, we make it through one storm, 
only to get knocked off our feet by another storm. Can anybody relate to this message tonight? I was hoping the storm was going to stay in 2021, but the storm keeps raging. It followed me into 2022. And I'm not just talking about physical storms. I'm talking about financial storms. Some of us here tonight are going through financial storms. And some of us here tonight are going through emotional storms. We're going through relationship storms. Our families are falling apart. Some of us here are going through emotional storms. We've lost people this last year near and dear to our heart. Some of us are going through spiritual storms. For some of us here tonight, we're, we've got a monsoon that's happening in our marriage. In Acts 27, Paul is on his way to Rome. And Paul's journey is plagued with problems, pain, bad decisions, bad weather, shipwrecks, and snake bites. I told you, that, that sounds like the past few years. But I've got good news, friends, a little spoil alert. If Paul made it through his storm, you're making it through our, this one. And we may not have accomplished everything we wanted to accomplish over the past few years. We may not have gone forward as, as much as we would have liked to have gone. In fact, we may have gone backwards just a little bit. But hallelujah, at least we're still alive. You see, sometimes the miracle is just making it. You see, just making it to camp meeting 2022 was a miracle. Because if, if you were to see all the times the enemy tried to take you out just on your way here. I want to I be honest with you, friends. Me making, making it to heaven, God getting me to glory, is, it, it, it may not look pretty, but I don't care as long as I get there, amen? I may not be the first one through the pearly gates. I may be the last one through the pearly gates. Just get me through the gates, amen? And so I would like to tell you that this year is going to be different, that this year it's all going to get better. I'd like to tell you that this year the storm is finally over, but I'm afraid, friends, the storm is going to keep raging, and when it does, like this scene from Paul, whatever you do, don't you dare lose hope. You see, I see too many Christians giving up on God. I see too many people giving up on the church. I see too many Christians throwing in the towel. I see too many people throwing in the towel on the church. I see too many couples throwing in the towel for their marriage. But every time I've tried to throw in the towel, God throws it back in my face. We serve a God who does not give up on us. Amen? Oh, man, the storm keeps raging, but I don't care because my God keeps on saving. Come on, let's give him some glory, the great things he has done. And so notice it says, after they had gone a long time without food, Paul stood up before them and said, men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself all this damage and loss. So notice, Paul is human. Paul's got to throw out a little, I told you so. You know, I'm a parent of four kids, and as parents, we learn that very quickly. I told you so. You know, I told you not to date that loser. I told you not to marry that person. I told you. Not to play around with that stuff. I told you that addiction runs in your family. I told you to stop fooling around. I told you. I mean, it's just normal. Sometimes we've got to say, I told you so. You should have taken my advice. You should have listened to me. And you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. You see, Paul has faith, but he's still frustrated. He says, God's going to deliver us. That's faith. But it didn't have to be this hard. Frustration. Faith doesn't exempt us from frustration. 
You see, listening to God does not guarantee smooth sailing, but I do guarantee you it does cause a whole lot less damage and loss. So Paul says, I told you so. But he doesn't stay there. He doesn't stay there. Sometimes we gotta, we gotta do the I told you so, but don't stay there. He gets out of the problem and he gets into the solution. Notice what he says. He says, but now I urge you to keep up your courage because not one of you will be lost only the ship will be destroyed. You see, friends, some of your stuff might be destroyed along the way, but hallelujah, not one of you are going to be lost if you put yourself in the hands of God. You might lose some stuff. That's okay. When Jesus comes back, he's burning it up. You can't take it with you anyway. Lord, you can burn my stuff, but don't burn me up with it. Not one of you will be lost, only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the Lord, of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, stood beside me. And I said, do not be afraid. And said, do not be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar. Basically, the angel tells Paul, you're not going down in this storm. You're not going down in this battle because I've got bigger battles for you to face. Listen to me, friends. You're not going down in this battle because God's got bigger battles for you to fight. You see, this is the thing. The storm on the sea was just getting Paul ready for the storm before Caesar. You see, that's the thing about the storms of life. They just get you ready for the next storm. You get through the one storm and you rely on God and then, and then another storm comes you. The enemy's gonna try to knock you off your feet. You see, each storm is just getting you ready for that next storm. And let me tell you, friends, there is a storm that is coming, but the storm cannot touch your Savior. Every storm is getting us ready for the next one. Behold, God has granted you all of those who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Folks, this is the type of faith I want. Amen? That in spite of how rough the storm looks, if God said he's going to get me through, I have faith it's going to happen just as he told me. If God said I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, then I have faith it's going to happen just as he told me. If God said everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. If God said he can heal me, I have faith in God it's going to happen as he told me. If in his infinite wisdom. He doesn't heal me. Well, I know he's coming back to get me. I believe if he said, behold, I'm coming back quickly. I have faith in God. It's going to happen just as he told me. I want the kind of faith that Paul had. I don't care how rough the storm may get. If God said it, then you can believe it. Give him the glory, great things he hath done. You know, the thing I noticed about this story is as you're reading this story about Paul, the way Paul acts, you forget that Paul is a prisoner. You see, Paul doesn't act like a prisoner. Paul acts like a child of God. Paul doesn't act like a prisoner. And, and you start noticing Paul is telling the crew and the, and the centurions what to do. You forget Paul is, 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 isn't a prisoner. He doesn't act like a prisoner. He's not a victim of his circumstances. He doesn't let the storm invade his spirit. What about you? What do you do when the storm keeps raging? I want to know, do you act like a prisoner or do you act like Paul? I don't know about you, but I want to act like Paul. And here's the thing, don't think that because you're in a storm, it means you did something wrong. Paul's in a storm because he did something right. 
This, this ridiculous idea, and you know, I, I, I talk with people who identify as Christians, and, and they say stuff to me, you know, that they say stuff to me like, you know, I'll ask them, you know, so, so, so are, are you a Christian? And they'll say this. They'll say, well, I'm trying. There is no trying. You either are or you're not. There is no trying. Either you're covered by the blood of the Lamb or you're not. If you're saved by grace through faith in Christ or you're not. Or they adopt this idea that if they're a Christian, nothing too bad will ever happen to them. Look out. Jesus was the most Christian person who ever lived, and his life was filled with rejection and injustice. You see, there is no storm-free clause in your Christianity contract. And that's the thing, when people think that joining the church means no more problems, those people are always twice as mad as everybody else. Yeah, they're bitter, angry people because, you see, they're mad because it, because it happened, and then they're mad because it happened to them. How could you let this happen, Lord? How could you let this happen? But notice, Paul doesn't waste time wondering, why me? Why me? Well, why not you? What makes you so special that you don't have problems, but everybody else should? Paul doesn't waste his time looking for a reason. You know why? Because even if God gave you a reason why you went through that hard time, that reason wouldn't help you. Some of us here tonight have gone through some devastating times and we have, we've called out to God and we've said, why, why me and why? But here's the thing, God doesn't give you a reason because a reason would not help. You know, if you lose someone you love, knowing why and they they died, that that is not going to help you. And that's why God very rarely ever gives. In fact, you look throughout the Bible and you'll see that he very rarely, if ever, gives people a reason. He doesn't waste time with wondering why. Paul doesn't waste time looking for a reason because a reason will not help you. You see, not everything that happens happens for a reason. Sometimes storms just happen because we live in a sinful world. People don't need a reason why they're hurting, church. They just need a little bit of hope. People don't need to be reminded what they did wrong or how they messed up. They just need a little bit of reassurance. You see, Paul's in a storm because of someone else's dumb decision. Anyone here ever been in a storm because of somebody else's dumb decision? And what's amazing about God is that he can even use other people's dumb decisions in order to get you to your purpose. God can take bad things that he did not cause and he can bring about good things. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. This is one of the most misquoted, taken out of context verse. Because people will say it as though everything that happens was was caused by God. That all things that happen are from God. Notice it doesn't say everything that happens is good, and it doesn't say everything that happens from God. It it doesn't say that. It says that God can use everything, even bad things, in order to move you into his purpose. God can even use a shipwreck to get Paul where he wants him to be. What the enemy tried to defeat Paul with, hallelujah, God used to get Paul to where he wanted him to go. When Joseph is reunited with his brothers, the very ones that betrayed him, sold him out. One of the most powerful verses in all the Bible. He says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. So which is it? Is it good or is it evil? The answer is both. You see, God didn't cause it, but God can still use it to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So friends, stop wasting your time looking for a reason why you've been going through a storm. Instead of looking for a reason, I want you to start looking for a revelation. 
Throughout the Bible, when people ask for a reason, God answers instead with a revelation of himself. God did not give Stephen a reason why, right after he's ordained as a deacon, he gets stoned. Instead, he gives Stephen a revelation of himself. God does not give Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego a reason. They get thrown into the furnace, but he gave them something better, a revelation of himself. God did not give John a reason he was on Patmos or the storm of pain that was coming towards Christianity. But I find it interesting that right after John talks about tribulation, God gives him a revelation. He turns around and he sees these golden lampstands which represent the church and right in the middle of the storm, right in the middle of the church, John sees Jesus. You see, I don't need a reason the storm keeps raging. I just need to know that Jesus is in the middle of the storm with me. Do you believe Jesus is in the storm with you right now? In Acts 27, 31, last night an angel of God to whom I belong, whom I serve, stood beside me. You see, this is why sometimes God allows the storm to happen in order to give you a revelation of himself. In Acts 27, nevertheless, we must run aground on some island. You see, sometimes God has to allow us to hit the brick wall. You see, God had to allow me to hit rock bottom, which I'll share with you tomorrow night. Sometimes God's got to allow that because, you see, it's only when we reach the end of our rope that we'll ever reach out and take the hand of God. You see, friends, it wasn't until I hit my rock bottom that I found out Jesus Christ was the rock at my bottom. Sometimes we've got to run aground because you keep trying to sail this storm on your own and you can't. For too long, we've been trying to coast through this storm and deal with our storms. We've been trying to micromanage our miracles, but it can't. You've got to run aground so that you'll start building your life on the rock of ages, Jesus Christ. According to Acts 27, 11, it says that the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. Instead of listening to God, they listened to professionals. And look, I have a lot of respect for professionals. Just remember that a professional can only treat the symptoms. My God can actually solve the problems. I'm, I'm, I believe in professionals, but this is the thing. When the church relies only on professionals, we get what only professionals could do, and that's not too much. When the church relies only on the smart people, we get what only smart people can do, and let me tell you, it's not that much. When the church relies on good music, we get what only good music can do, and let me tell you, it's not much. When the church relies on good preaching, we get what only good preaching can do, but that's not much. But when the church relies on preaching, prayer, we get what an almighty, awesome, omniscient, omnipotent God can do. We got to build our church on something bigger and better than just good preaching and seminar attending. And I love camp meetings. They're great. But don't you dare leave this place without using what you learned here out there. Because it can become even more of a detriment to your spirituality than a blessing. You got to use it or you lose it. So they listened to the professional. But the people survived the storm. But like I said, they lost their stuff. Not a hair is to perish from the head of any of you. Friends, the last few years have been rough. People have lost their jobs. People have lost their life savings. People have lost relationships and they've lost marriages. Some people tragically have even lost their lives. I've never done more funerals than I have over the past several years. I've never done more counseling to hurting broken families than I have done the past few years. People are hurting, but listen to me right now. There is nothing that we can lose in this life that if you ground your life in Jesus, you won't get back only better when Christ returns. 
You see, that's what's beautiful. We get our bodies back only better this time without the arthritis. We get our brains back only better this time without the Alzheimer's disease. We get our friends, we get our family back only better this time without the bad mood and without the bad attitude. Why do you think the author of Hebrews calls it the better resurrection? Romans says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What storm can possibly come between you and your Savior? Shall distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, or abuse, or divorce, or disease? No, in all of these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. You see, friends, the storm keeps raging, but Jesus Christ keeps on saving And so the Bible tells us that they were brought safely through. I want you to know tonight, you're going to be brought safely through. And they learned that the island that they were on was an island called Malta. Now this really blew me away in my studies, but do you know what the word, what the name Malta means? It means refuge. You see, God doesn't prevent the bad things from happening, but he always provides refuge. One of my roles now at the union is the church growth director and revitalization. And if I could choose, I got asked this quite a bit. The one thing that I think is is keeping the churches growing and declining so rapidly. It's this right here. The church has not yet become a safe place for sinners wrecked by the storms of life. The church has to become more of a refuge. The church is called to be a place of refuge for the people that are wrecked by the storms of life. People shouldn't have to worry about the debris and the nonsense from the storms out out in the world coming into the church and hitting them in there. The church should be a place of refuge from the hate, from the gossip, from the condemnation of the world, is your church a safe place for the shipwrecked? It is really sad when people have to go to other places other than the church to find safety from the storm. As a church, we we didn't talk about issues we should have been talking with our kids and with young people, and we haven't been dealing with those issues. We just don't ask, don't tell. And so they go to those other places to get answers for their questions. But we've got the answer they need. Is your church a safe place for the shipwrecked? Notice Malta. Look at what the Bible says about Malta. The native people showed us, check this out, unusual kindness, for they kindled a fire and they welcomed us all because it had begun to rain and it was cold. You see, what Paul says about these natives, people should say about Seventh-day Adventists. They are unusually kind. Now notice, I didn't say they're unusual. We get enough of that. I didn't say they've got some unusual ways of doing things. I didn't say they've got some unusual casseroles. I said unusual kindness. Instead of being known for what we're against, I got an idea. Let's start being known for what we're for. Like Malta, if we want to be a refuge to our community, let's be known for our unusual kindness. Let's, man, when people walk into our door, may they leave and say, you know what? I ain't never been to a church that loved people like that church. There's got to be a God up in heaven. And I'm not just talking about being nice to people who sin like you do. That's easy. I'm not talking about loving people that are easy to love. Jesus says, what reward is that? Even the pagans love people like that. No, I'm talking about loving people who sin radically different than you do. 
I'm not saying love the sin. I'm saying love the sinner. Yeah, they may struggle with that, but you struggle with a mean spirit and we let you come to church. <laughs> we, no, you don't want them to be deacon. You know, that's what kills me. You know, we won't let someone join the church if they're still struggling with this habit or that habit. But man, they can be as mean as a snake and we'll make them an elder. I want to be known for being unusually kind. When I needed help, when I was at the bottom of my barrel, the church was not the first stop on the block for me. I had to go somewhere else first to get refuge. According to the story, these natives of Malta build a fire to warm the shipwrecked. Our churches are called to be warm places The church should be the warmest place on the planet. Paul's on an island because he's shipwrecked, so he's at a place he hadn't planned on being. Have you ever been to a place that you hadn't planned on being? You're on Malta right now. You see, when you signed the marriage license, you never planned on also signing the divorce papers. Welcome to Malta. You always ate right and exercised right, but you end up with a bad diagnosis. Welcome to Malta. You see, people don't plan on their kids being addicts. People don't, grandparents don't plan on raising their grandkids. People don't plan on losing their job. People don't plan on filing bankruptcy. You see, Malta, is a lonely, cold, unexpected place. Has anyone here ever been to Malta? Maybe you're on Malta right now. The church needs to be a refuge for people on Malta. And this is what's really crazy about this storm is that just when you think the storm is over, just when you don't think it can get any worse, guess what? It does. I told you my sermon, the storm keeps raging. Notice Acts 28. Paul gathered a bundle of sticks and put them on a fire. And a viper came out because of the heat and fastened onto his hand. So quick review. Paul's in prison for preaching the gospel. He's shipwrecked because people didn't want to listen to him. He's cold, wet, marooned on an unexpected place called uh, 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 Malta. And just when he thinks the storm is over, a snake comes out and bites him. Anyone ever had a day like that? Come on, this last year was like that. We're only halfway, we're almost halfway through the year. And it's been a year like that. It reminds me of that verse in Amos. In that day, you'll be like a man who runs from a lion, only to meet a bear, and escaping from the bear, he leans his hand against the wall in his house and is bitten by a snake. (laughs) See, when when you got baptized and you joined the church, you thought your storm was over. Until that saint, I mean that snake, came in and bit you. You were promised the promotion. You've been there longer than anyone else. You worked twice as hard, twice as long. But then you found out there was a snake and he bit you. You married your high school sweetheart. You met your spouse on AdventistSingles.com. But then you realize you married a snake. And that snake bit you. No, I'm not talking about a literal snake. David talks about it. He says, they make their tongue sharp as serpents, and under their lips is the venom of asps. Anyone here ever been bit by an asp? Asp. An asp. And notice, you'll see that the snake doesn't just strike him and let him go. The Bible says that this snake fastens on to him. I wonder, has anything ever fastened onto you? 
Has anything, a habit fastened onto your life, that website fastened onto your life, that anger and resentment fastened onto your life? Maybe it's a great disappointment, a bad decision, chronic depression. You can't ever seem to shake it. You changed your diet. You changed all the stuff, but you still can't shake it. Check this out. When the native people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, no doubt this man is a murderer. (laughs) Isn't that just like people? Hey, did you hear? They got a divorce. Yeah, he must have cheated on her. We do the same stuff. We always got to think the worst, you know? You can do everything right your whole life. You do one thing wrong, and they'll remember you for the one wrong thing you ever did. No doubt this man's a murderer because he's getting what he deserved. Why do we always think the worst of people? You don't know what they're going through. You don't know what the, what's happening in their life. And so we'll check it out. They're waiting for him to swell up or suddenly fall down dead. Some of us are just watching new believers fall out of the church. You know, if I, if I made a, you know, if, as a pastor, if pastors make a change to the order of service, we're going to be hit up by like 10 saints before we make it to the back door. But how come when the new member goes missing, I don't hear from any of you? Come on. I'm talking about priorities. Stop sitting back and watching people swell up and fall out of the church. I'm the son of an evangelist. My uncle was an evangelist. Man, when you're born as a Halverson, first time I met your president, Gary Rusted, it was evangelism. My dad and his dad were doing evangelism in McGavick High School in Nashville, Tennessee. And so evangelism, evangelism, you know we hear all the time as evangelists is they'll try to say, well, man, why didn't the people stay in the church? It must have been that evangelist baptized them too soon. No, 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 no. He didn't baptize them too soon. You loved them too little. Quit blaming the evangelist. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we get them in the church. You got to hold on to them. And so they waited a long time, saw no misfortune come to him, and check this out. This is powerful. They changed their minds and said, he must be from God. How do you respond to the snake bites of life? How do you treat people when they hurt you? What do you do when things don't go your way? What do you do when the church does something you don't like? What do you do when the pastor does something you don't like? Notice Paul didn't get on a pity pot. He didn't have to write about it on Facebook. He didn't give up on the church. He didn't say, you know what, they hurt my feelings. I'm leaving. What did Paul do? The Bible says Paul shook the snake off. Right here is the secret to surviving the the storms and the snakes of life. You got to shake it off. I get it, the person hurts you, now shake it off. I get it, you were mistreated, now shake it off. I get it, you didn't like the board's decision, get over it, shake it off. Someone disappointed you, I'm sure at some point in your life you disappointed someone too. Shake it off. The problem is, sometimes like Paul's viper, that thing really, really latches on. In those moments when that thing latches on, man, you've got to just keep on shaking. You've got to shake it until it no longer affects your worship. You've got to shake it until it's no longer hurting your relationship. You've got to shake it until you're no longer losing sleep over it. You've got to shake off the resentment, shake off the shame. You've got to keep shaking the habit, the hang up, the heartache. As Jerry Lee Lewis famously said, there should be a whole lot of shaking going on. The church needs to be a safe place for people to shake off the snakes. Don't you dare leave this place tonight with something still hanging from your heart. 
Don't you dare leave this place with the shame and and the guilt. Why do you keep bringing sins up to God that he can't remember? Stop letting that devil hang from your heart. In Christ, there is no condemnation. Notice Paul didn't hold on to the snake. So why are you still holding on to the resentment? You see, that's the problem. The snake's not even latched on to you. You've latched, you've latched on to the snake. <laughs> you won't let the snake go. <laughs> now, how many people I have talked to who are absolutely miserable in the church because they cannot let go of a snake. They have latched onto it and they've allowed it to just burn and destroy their inside. You see, resentments are funny. Resentments, we resent people because we want to hurt them, but it only hurts us. Nothing will make you more bitter and angry than resentment. Stop latching on to that shame and pain. It's not latched on to you. You've latched on to it. You won't You don't let go of it, it's poison, and it will take you out. And you know what, this is what's really beautiful about this story is that when people saw Paul shake it off, they believed there was a God up in heaven. I hope you know, church, people are watching. Parents, I hope you know your children are watching you, and they are learning how to love their future spouse through your love for each other. Seventh-day Adventist, I hope you know that people are watching you 24-7, not just for an hour on Saturdays. When you declare yourself an Adventist, they watch you, they see you, they analyze you. They're just like, what is up with these people? People are watching. The question is, for all of us tonight, is are you living a life worth watching? Is your Christianity worth, is, is your Christianity something worth noticing? The Bible says that they change their minds. Check it out. The way you respond to storms and snake bites can change someone's mind about God, change someone's mind about the church. You see, when you study, um, when you study why people have left the church, why we're hemorrhaging young people, Dr. Parker from Southern here did a fascinating study on Adventists. That our kids aren't leaving because of our doctrines. They're leaving a church because we're not discipling them, loving them, and letting them serve and lead out in the church. We're not loving them. We can change someone's mind about the church with the way that we love. Someone might have thought that God was condemning, but now that they've been to your church, they believe that he's a loving God. Someone might have been ready to give up on their marriage, but then they met you and you changed their mind and now they're giving it another try. Maybe someone was getting ready to give up, but then they met you and now they want to hold on. I want to live the kind of life that people change their minds about their situation. I really can make it. I really can shake it. I can live clean. I can recover from opioids. I can become a a respectable member of society. I can live a new life because if it happened to that rascal Richie, it can happen to me. I don't know about you, but as I read this story, I kept thinking, man, thank goodness Paul was on board. Here's the thing. I want people to think the same thing about Christians. Thank goodness they're in our community. Thank goodness we nominated them to be on the church board. Thank goodness they joined Facebook. (laughs) I've read some of y'all's Facebook posts. Ain't nobody saying that about your Facebook post. Mercy. Man, I want my kids to think, thank goodness he's our dad. I want my wife to think, thank goodness I married him. Not, what in the world was I thinking? (laughs) You see, the storm was better because Paul was in it. This world should be better because Seventh-day Adventists are in it. 
We should not be adding to the hatred. We should not be adding to the injustice. We should not be adding to the hurt. We should not be adding to the prejudice. We should not be adding to the pain. We should be different. Now in the neighborhood of that place where lands belonging to the chief man of the island named Publius who received us and entertained us hospitably for three days, And it happened that the father of Publius lay sick with fever and dysentery and Paul visited him and prayed and putting his hands on him, healed him. Think about it. Had Paul never been in the storm, had he never been shipwrecked and marooned on Malta, had the snake bite never bit him, he never would have had this opportunity to serve. You see, your storm might be someone else's salvation. The same hand, check this out, the same hand that the snake bit Paul is now using to bless. (laughs) The hand bit by a snake, which should have killed Paul, is now being used by Paul to save someone else. The same hand that had a snake hanging from it now has Holy Spirit power flowing from it. Church, you may not understand why you got to go through this storm, but I believe one day God's going to use your storm to touch someone else. God wants to take the pain from this past year and use it to bring healing into the lives of people this next year. The place the enemy bit you, God is going to use to save you and someone else with you. The very thing the enemy tried to kill me with God is now using to reach people with. Friends, the storm keeps raging. And I can promise you, the snakes are going to keep biting. But I'm going to keep claiming that I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you and in me will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I'm going to keep claiming that this is the will of him who sent me, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, but raise it up on the last day. Oh, the enemy will never stop coming at you. He wants you to give in. He wants you to give up. He wants you to abandon all hope. He wants you to say, I'll never be saved. But listen, he cannot beat you because the devil is already beaten. According to verse 7, it says it was three days from the snake bite to when this man was healed. Three days after Paul is bit by a snake, Paul brings healing to a whole town. You know, the Bible is one big narrative. All the little stories pointing to the ultimate story of the everlasting gospel. And that the fall... God says to the snake, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman. And you get to Revelation, you know the woman is the church. I'm going to put this enmity, this anger, this hostility between you and the woman and the offspring and hers. And, And friends, you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, the woman and the snake keep fighting. But then God doesn't stop there. He says to the devil, yes, you're going to strike his heel, but he's going to use that heel to crush your head. Don't you see, friends, the very heel that was bit is the heel that crushes the serpent's head. You see, what the enemy thought he would defeat Christ with, Christ uses to defeat him with. On Calvary, the enemy did his worst. He struck Jesus' heel with all the venom that he had. But hallelujah, three days later, Jesus steps out of the grave and onto the serpent's head. And now healing and salvation and resurrection comes from nail-scarred hands. When the world did its worst, God gave his best. The Bible says he loved us all the way to the end. The Greek is even better. It says he loved us all the way to his goal. When neither sun 
nor stars appeared for many days, and the storm continued raging. We finally gave up all hope of ever being saved. But right when they're at the point of giving up, that's when God shows up. Daniel 12.1 tells us the storm's going to keep raging. There shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, our prince will stand up and deliver his people, everyone whose name is found written in the book of life. And friends, check it out. Just like Paul shook the snake off into the fire, one day soon, Jesus is going to do the same thing to the accuser, the devil, who had deceived them, is thrown into the lake of fire. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. The storm is almost over. Hold on a little longer. When the storm keeps raging, Jesus keeps saving. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. Surrender to your Savior tonight. Let us pray. Father, we thank you and we praise you for the awesome God that you are. For all that you have done and all you will continue to do in the lives of your people. And Lord, we've been through a rough, rough past few years. The enemy is trying to take out your bride with the stormiest weather we've seen. Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, you would surround each of your people here tonight. That you would remind them tonight that because Christ defeated the ultimate storm on Calvary, because Christ allowed the dark clouds to envelop him on Calvary, No matter what storms we go through in life, well, one thing we know, because Jesus went through the ultimate storm, we're coming through our storm. That nothing, nothing can come between us and salvation when Christ is the rock of our lives. And Lord, maybe someone here has never made that decision to surrender all to Jesus Maybe someone here is still holding on to a snake that they should have let go of a long time ago. Lord, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus for healing to fill their lives. Lord, I pray right here in this place, in the quietness of their own heart, Lord, maybe the decision for baptism, it is time to step into the water with Jesus. I pray that they will make that decision tonight and they will run, not walk, they will run to their pastor or to one of the workers here, the employees, the volunteers, and say, I want to plan on being baptized. Lord, I pray for victory in the mighty name of Jesus. With Jesus in the ship, we can smile at the storm. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.